Shumrabyug. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Shlook. Shlook, listen, the podcast that takes a pop at culture. Shlook, sure listen. 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 Oh, very good, Benjamin. This week I'm going to be making an effort to speak a little bit louder since I got a phone call from my mother who complained to me that you're always louder in the reels than I am. And she's, a... <laughs> she's pretty convinced, Benjamin, that you put a reduction on my volume so that people can hear you more. But you look, we don't have time to get into whether that's true or not because we've loads of stuff to look at, including Sentry Legacy is out. Or I think it's just called Sentry, but... Look, we'll get into it later. Also, there's a new trailer for Ripley starring Dublin's own Irishman Suspos, Andrew Ripley. And, Ben, <laughs> there's another trailer out for Roadhouse starring Ireland's own other Irishman Suspos, Connor McRoadhouse. And yep. <laughs> we've had a trailer for Avatar The Last Ender Airbender, open brackets, sorry about that last one, we'll do it right this time, close brackets. And Monkeyman. Yeah, sure, listen, Michael, if that wasn't enough and if that wasn't the best intro you've ever done for sheer comedic value, 10 Thank out of 10, yeah, yeah, I was well played. On. I was working on that. I've been uh, trying to work on my techniques, Ben. <laughs> I'm being loud. Man, is this all right? Can you hear me now? First of all, Mrs. Mrs. Mick, if you're listening. <laughs> oh, wife. Oh, sorry, Mick's mammy, if you're yeah. listening. Yeah. I am just a very loud man. It's yeah, yeah. it's yeah. Yeah. it's, yeah. it's yeah. very unfortunate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there's an argument to be made that if you were to let me stand out in an open space and record the podcast, we wouldn't actually need to invest in advertising or any other form of getting an audience in because you'd hear me anywhere on the island. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I will put a voice upper on your son Thanks. for future episodes. Yeah, yeah. I do that, Ben. So that's that's neither here nor there. Also, the reason that Ben <laughs> doesn't stand in the field and just do the podcast is it was actually declared illegal in the Geneva Conventions. It's considered a war crime. It is, yeah. It's uh, mental uh, me- mental warfare yeah, is yeah, what it's called. Just make people <laughs> listen to this podcast whether they want to or not. But look, Ben, we've got things to review <laughs> and some other stuff to talk about. And that's your bit. <laughs> sure, listen, Mick. If we weren't so derailed already, we're taking a look at The Brother's Son from Netflix. And we're taking a look at the trope of Gaia's Revenge. Ooh. Nature's Wrath. Oh. oh, no. Oh, what's going on? Yeah. Yeah, but first, Michael, yes. let's talk about Marvel's wrath. What's going on there? Benjamin. Yeah. Over the last few years, Marvel has been accused of um, forced diversity. Yes. Now, look, we're not going to touch that with a barge pole, right? Nope. But one of the ways in which people have kind of complained and suggested to Marvel that it might be a better way to do things is to introduce new characters rather than introducing new versions of beloved characters who are more diverse. Mm-hmm. Now, Benjamin, where, what your take on that is, n- neither here nor there. Because generally people are talking about beloved characters. Oh, there's a new Spider-Man, and she's young, and she's Asian. Okay, oh, Benjamin, so that's Silk. There's a new, yeah, 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 that's Silk. Oh, Benjamin, yeah. there's a new Hulk, but he's young, and he's Asian, and he's smart. That's Amadeus, Amadeus Cho. Amadeus Cho, very good, Benjamin. There's a new Captain Marvel, Benjamin, but she's a Muslim girl. Yeah, Kamala Khan. Kamala Khan. There's a new Spider-Man, Benjamin, but he's a young, half-black, half-Hispanic kid. That's Miles Morales. Yeah, so people have complaints about this, Benjamin. But you know what the kind of unifying thing about all of those characters is? I will get this podcast cancelled if I give my honest no, answer. yeah, you don't say anything, Ben. Yeah. Because the unifying <laughs> thing about them is they're all new versions of characters that people care about. And... Marvel has kind of gone, ah, fuck it, that's not working. Let's start doing new versions of characters that people don't care about. Yeah, and that's how we got Sentry Legacy, maybe. So, it's not called Sentry Legacy, it's just called Sentry Benjamin. I have been a big fan of the Sentry experiment ever since it started in the year 2000. Do we want to get into it briefly? Do we have time? That's the Avengers run, isn't it? It's the Avengers... No. No, it's not? Sentry was a mini-series, Benjamin, in the year 2000. out of town. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was a miniseries in the year 2000 by artist Jay Lee, wasn't it? And Paul Jenkins, right? Right. And what they did was, they did a thing that was novel at the time. They claimed that Stan Lee had created a character 
in the 60s who was so powerful that he had to be forgotten for the good of the Marvel Universe. Mm, look at that. And the comic series, the, the short miniseries, was simultaneously a retelling of some of those stories and Sentry as a character coming back into the character's memories in the modern day. Mm-hmm. Now, Benjamin, that was only in, that was in the year 2000. That was in the year 2000, Michael. It ran for a year, from 2000 yeah. to 2001. Yeah, well, it was a mini-series, you see. Oh, and I see. It was a fascinating experiment in forgotten character from the depths of history come back to modern times. Very Garth Morrison. Yeah, 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 yeah. They... <laughs> Garth Morrison it's Garth Ennis or Grant, Grant Morrison. Morrison very good you've done that on purpose Benjamin I big have. wink there's a big wink for you for Thanks. you and the listeners but Benjamin what they did was they even promoted it like this is a missing character they had articles written by fake journalists looking into the history of Sentry and where he went yeah. and what happened to him great little experiment that's pretty good yeah it was cool and then it turned out Benjamin that the Sentry is also the void oh no Two sides of the same powerful character. One a golden guardian of good, and the other an evil smoky tendril man in a hat. No, oh, not a smoky tendril man in a hat. And Benjamin, it is the sentry's... I suppose it is the sentry's crux to bear that wherever he goes, the void will eventually appear. And the only way to protect people from the overwhelming evil of the sentry is to forget... Of the void, excuse me, is to forget about the sentry. Yes, Okay. Now, great concept. Yeah, great it's solid. Concept. Great idea. Fabulous idea for a mini series. So good an idea, in fact, that Marvel have gone back to that well a number of times, and they've created other characters who were super powerful from the beginning of the the universe that people have forgotten about for different reasons. Like, for example, Blue Marvel. Yeah, Blue Marvel. Look at that guy. Practically the same story. Yeah. But he he was forgotten because of racism, not because of the big smoky evil monster creature which is anyway, kind of interesting one of the problems with comics is no matter what you do no matter how self-contained and unique and interesting your story is the next writer is going to come along and go get him in the avengers though yeah get him in there get him in there and that left them with a weird proposition of having the sentry character being in the avengers which they did massively overpowered character superman to the max in sometimes on ground level teams and they always struggled with an identity for him really yeah he was he was a very mixed up he had a real long run michael from the new avengers forward he he he, he played a bizarre role in each of those he's discovered in the the raft prison yeah in in the basement essentially where he's been kept inexplicably for a very long time and he he kind of Deus ex machina or century ex machina's mm. uh, carnage out of out of a he gets Daredevil out of a sticky wicket yeah, yeah, as yeah. it were and very famously takes carnage up into space and rips him apart yeah and uh, that was his big kind of thing was like oh this guy is fucking serious. powerful big serious powerful guy and then famously during the siege storyline he ripped Ares in half yeah not a bother to him big fan of ripping things in half Rip as the sentry and then humorously Benjamin in the the Null storyline from a couple of years back the very same thing happened to him yes he gets ripped in half by Null god yeah. of the symbiotes because if comics have taught us nothing it's take your most powerful character and do a spectacularly bad thing to them to show how powerful the new character is that's fucking sustainable Yes, Hulk syndrome, as yeah, it's yeah, often yeah. known. Or Worf syndrome for Star Trek. Or, or Worf syndrome from Star Trek. It's interesting, Michael, that that DC kind of went with the back-breaking yeah, yeah, thing. Yeah. So basically, if you wanted to show that a character was really bad in the Batverse, he'd break Batman's back yeah. and he'd do the knee crunch. I don't know what that's called, Michael. Or it's is called it a full a, Nelson? No, Benjamin, that's called full... a backbreaker. Oh, it's called a backbreaker. That's convenient. Isn't it? Um, and, and then Marvel said, oh, that's good. But what if we did it in half? Ripping people in half up in space. So ben, up in space. Here's the question that you were asking me earlier. Yeah. When Sentry was ripped into bits by Null, yeah, where, yeah. where did his energy dissipate to? Yeah, where could it have gone? Where could it have gone, Benjamin? Now, you didn't ask me that because no one gives a flying shite. Not one of us, because ladies and gentlemen. Because it's nothing to do with Sentry that his power dissipates and can be recombobulated. Sentry, void, good, evil, dichotomy, forget. Yeah. Now also, his power can spread. So in the new series, Benjamin, your favourite character and mine, Jessica Jones. 
Oh yeah, heard it runs the detective agency and kills David Tennant. Yeah, 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 Spoilers yeah. for a series that came out nearly ten, ten years, years ago. ago. Yeah, yeah. And your other favorite character, Misty Jones. That's not her name. That, Misty Knight. That sounds. Misty that Knight. sounds like something else. Misty Michael, Knight. Misty don't. Knight. Jessica no, Jones. Nobody look up Misty Jones. Don't look up nobody Misty Jones. Seventies porn star. Misty Knight. Benjamin. They're they're teaming up and they're going around investigating some strange incidents of the Sentry's power signature being detected. Oh. And oh. what it turns out, Benjamin, is that people around the world are getting glimpses they're getting portions of the sentry's power like some get his super speed some get his super flight some get his laser eyes some get his power of a million exploding suns and they're all a very very diverse collection of people so there's a there's a latina lady who's a wheelchair user because she has ms there's a an indian inhuman immigrant bicycle courier there is a there's a black lady who works in a supermarket and she's brave because she stops muggers. And oh, that's good, there's yeah. A, there's a blonde-haired, blue-eyed farm boy from Ohio. So, Michael, and they all get uh, portions of Sentry's power, Ben. Right. So I want you to do something for me for a second. Yeah. Which of those characters that I've just described do you think is going to be the baddie? It's it's definitely the blue eyed blonde yeah, yeah, Ohio yeah, yeah, farm yeah. boy. Yeah, hundred percent. And which one do you think is going to be the hero? Is it the woman in the wheelchair? Because yeah, she's is the very most so, disabled. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very much so. Oh dear. So, I mean, I really didn't want to not like it, but but you don't like it. It's just. So, you know, a lot of the time when I hear people complaining about, oh, forced diversity and, oh, they're vilifying white men. And it's like, oh, get over yourselves. Not everything's for you. But yeah. then this is like something that someone would come up to go. <laughs> what do you think of this then? <laughs> yeah. I it's a, uh, Look, it's, it's odd. It's very strange. It's very, very strange. But aside from that, because that's borderline irrelevant, that's practically just a, an aside to this my main point is who cares who's asking for the century legacy who cares if a latina woman who's usually a wheelchair user gets the century's powers did anyone care about the century enough to care where his powers went i didn't he was generally just a giant plot device as to why mm. the avengers couldn't swoop in and knock seven say, shades of shit out of norman osborne because he had the century on side yeah 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 Exactly. So my my kind of question is, are they going to go back to the well on the void in this? Are they going to are they going to mix it up? Are uh, are are they leading me down a garden path of going, oh, this is just so predictable. And who's who's writing it? I forget who's writing it. If it's if it's not Jonathan Hickman, then you're not getting that. <laughs> um, not Jonathan Hickman. Uh, if it's not Jonathan Hickman or Chip Zdarsky, you're not getting that from this series. Um, anyway, that's so, pretty much all we have to say about it. the Sentry, the uh, new version. There's a lot more than I thought we were going to have to say about Sentry, the new version. Yeah, I yeah, won't it's, lie. It's a lot more than anyone has said about the Sentry in fucking years. Yeah. So at least at least we're talking about him. It, at least we're chatting about him. At least he's at least we're involved. Let's get us involved, you know. Um, but. Yeah, Michael, speaking of, of white people being the villain... Yes, go on. Uh, we got a trailer last week, Michael, right as we were recording our episode, for Ripley. Oh, go on. Yeah, Michael, Michael, do you know what's better than an Irishman so smalls? An Irishman so black and white. An Irishman so black and white. Or an Irishman so Venice. Doesn't matter which one you want, Michael. Mm. It's great. Andrew Scott's back. He's, he hasn't gone anywhere. Andrew Scott is the <laughs> flavour of the month, Michael. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's only a tiny little fella, Ben, famously. 173 centimetres given your last Google search result yeah yeah my my entire Google search history is just celebrity heights I think I might have a problem uh, Michael has a fixation ladies and gentlemen whenever there's a man who's given a little bit of attention in cinema um, <laughs> Michael's only way to cope with that I can't and fucking not deny this him. I can't deny this <laughs> It's to search their height and, and go he's not even that big he's not even that he's tall not even he's smaller than me <laughs> 
the the most stunning example of that, ladies and gentlemen, being when we talked about uh, none other than Jack Reacher and Alan Richson, famously large man, yeah, Alan yeah, Richson. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and to which Mick goes, no, but he's, he's not even as big as Jack Reacher's supposed to be. He's Jack not. Reacher's supposed to be reaching seven foot. No, he's six six. Alan, Jack Reacher's six, six. Alan Richson is like six three, ladies and gentlemen. Not tall enough. I hope he's a fucking ashamed of himself in his fucking lifts. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. We got a black and white trailer, uh, Michael, for an upcoming black and white series. It's coming out this very, very April. Is it a series? It's a series, Michael, oh. on the good old-fashioned Netflix. They love a good series, mm. um, Michael. Um, oh, no, you've made me doubt myself now. I hate when you do that. But anyway, this is based on Patricia Highsmith's very famous Ripley series. Was that a series uh, of thriller books? Uh, a series of thriller books called uh, The Ripleyad. Mm. Uh, and we'll get into that in a second. That's the real name given to that in publishing. And we'll get into that in a second. Did you say, but, listeners, Benjamin, did yes? you say The Rippling Abs? The Ripleyad, okay. Michael. The Ripleyad. Okay, like the Iliad. Um, <laughs> But yeah, exactly. But come here to be Michael. A lot of our listeners will be very, very familiar with this because they will have seen Jude Law and Matt Damon do this before in The Talented Mr. Ripley from 1999. 25 poxing years ago. 25 poxing years ago, Michael. Um, it's considered to be the best adaptation of the Ripley books and it is a fabulous film. Have you ever seen it? Yes. 25 poxing years ago. Yeah, if you're ever looking for like a really interesting thriller, then that is just the one to go for. Uh, the Talented Mr. Ripley is a phenomenal film. Matt Damon does a really fantastic job of it. It is a limited series, Michael, now that I've come back to it. Um, but it was written by Patricia Highsmith in the 1950s. And it's not a spoiler here, ladies and gentlemen, but Ripley, the, the man they're talking about, that's not his real name. He's a he's a psychopath social climber. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, um, um, like uh, Leonardo DiCaprio. Like Leonardo DiCaprio in anything. Um, yeah, he's a psychopath social climber, ladies and gentlemen, in the 1950s. And what he's doing is he's infiltrating, essentially, the American elite um, at a different point. There have been comparisons drawn, Michael, very, very early on here, to Saltburn, oh, cool. of all things. Yeah, is everyone having a wanky um, bath? Well, he, he, uh, hopefully. I, I long to see Andrew <laughs> Scott take care of himself in some form of washing apparatus. Oh. But, you know, that's that's my dream. <laughs> and we won't get into that in the podcast. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. from my yeah. other... Ben. That's my other podcast. Ben, ben yes. I'd like to point out that my uh of disgust there was not because of the homoerotic imagery, which I'm absolutely <laughs> fine with. It was just the fact that you were willing to bring it up on the podcast. It would be yeah, it was awful. just as creepy as, I said, as if I said that about Dakota Johnson. Yep, shocking. Um, so, uh, Millennial Saltburn is the way I would look at it, Michael. But, you know, Saltburn is based on the idea of a social climber who infiltrates, and we're not really sure if he's a victim of the upper classes or if he's taking advantage and climbing his way to the yeah, top. it's Barry Keoghan, though, so he's definitely, definitely it's taking Barry advantage. Barry Keoghan. But in this case, it's Irishman Andrew Scott, and he's going to be in it, Michael. Um, and it's a retelling of that famous 1999 movie. It's the first ever um, Ripley book. Um, and it is going to be him starring alongside Johnny Flynn who's playing Dickie Greenleaf he's taking over Jude Law's mm. role and um, luckily we're not going to have to deal with Gwyneth Paltrow in this one Michael um, because Marge Sherwood is played by uh, none other than Dakota Fanning oh that's good isn't it she's always busy yeah she's always busy um, and it comes from a pretty stellar screenwriter Michael uh, Steve Zalian who also gave us Schindler's List Gangs of New York and um, The Irishman oh two so of those are good two of those are good and we won't talk about the third um, but yeah The Ripley Ad was a bit of a publishing phenomenon Michael back in the day um, because it became one of the first big thriller series and what set it apart from a lot of the hard boiled detective fiction of the 1950s was the fact that this was around a psychopath. The psychopath was the main character. Hmm. Like American um, gods, no. American, American psycho. psycho. Now, that's, that's a great comparison because today, Michael, that's pretty standard. We have a ton of psychopath-driven narratives. For example, you, Penn yeah. Badgley's character yeah. in You, Killing is Eve. just a psychopath. Uh, Killing Eve, absolutely bog standard but back in the day Michael the Ripley character was one of the first to do that oh um, catch me if you can and the Rip 
Exactly. Catch Me If You Can is not quite the same because he's not a psychopath. He's just a... Well, he could be a psychopath, but he's a non-violent psychopath, yeah, Michael. Yeah, yeah. Um, which might be a more important way of discussing that particular one. But it's it's pretty interesting um, in that regard that we got this character. This was something that we'd never seen before in fiction publishing. And Patricia Highsmith became a really popular writer at that time for creating this individual. Now... There was a lot of speculation on Patricia Highsmith at the time because she was um, thought to be a lesbian at the time. Which again, in the 19... Pretty bog standard today, Michael. But in the 1950s, a pretty shocking revelation for a popular, successful white author to be. What were people saying? Were people saying, this book was written by a lesbian, I absolutely refuse to read it. And then throw... I refuse to read it, the sheer scandal. Um, Probably. Probably something along those lines. She but was many people probably believed... pleasuring another woman while she was writing this. <laughs> very, Do you imagine very, she was, very Shirley? competent multitasker. Do you imagine she might have been? What might that have looked like, Shirley? No, don't tell, tell me. I don't more. want to know. But but do give me a little detail. Just go do on. One or little. two little details. That's all I need before bed. So her writing was considered to be highly seductive. Oh. Um, and there was a bit of a moral panic about the fact that you rooted for the psychopath of the novel. Um, Tom Ripley is the name adopted by the psychopath of the series. Um, and he's a suave, agreeable and utterly amoral creature. He's a cold-blooded killer and a con artist. And people that read the book cannot help but be like, yeah, go for it, Tom. You fucking infiltrate those upper infiltrate classes. Infiltrate those upper classes, Tom, the pricks. <laughs> yeah. Um... And Highsmith has been praised a bunch of times for this. So we're seeing that come to screen, Michael, played by really the most charming Irishman of our times, Andrew Scott. Oh, what about the Farrell? Ah, the Farrell is very charming. But in terms of the roles that have been played by Andrew Scott, he's very good at being a contradictory, duplicitous, seductive bastard. Yeah, yeah, he was very good in the awful Sherlock. He was very good in the awful Sherlock. Some would argue the best part of the awful Sherlock. Yeah, yeah, except when it was over. That was the best. Except when it was over. That was the best bit for fuck, us. Fuck um, that but <laughs> fucking rubbish. <laughs> Fuck's sake. I hate Sherlock. Uh, <laughs> Michael's on one this week, ladies and gentlemen. Know, sorry. Michael, by the way, yeah, go on. It is normally our even keel representative. He's the man who provides a counterpoint to my, frankly, emotional outbursts mm. in favour or against something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm upset this week, though. I'm upset because I started to think about Sherlock. Fucking rubbish. And I'm very, very worried, ladies and gentlemen, because if he's not fulfilling that role, it falls to me. And ladies and gentlemen, as many of our listeners will know, I'm not very good at that. (laughs) Mm, Who's going to check the facts, Ben? Ladies and gentlemen, if you enjoy a non-fact-checked podcast and you've been (laughs) enjoying this absolutely higgledy-piggledy roller coaster of a pop culture information podcast, consider giving us a review. Wherever you listen. There's a few different places you can do it. Hop on down there to whatever the star rating system on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or otherwise is, and give us a review. We'd love it. Very good indeed. Benjamin. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of the most charming Irishman, Sisboss. Yeah. We got a bloody trailer this week for new UFC sponsored film Roadhouse <laughs> thank you very much it took you a while there the main name of what we're talking about Michael is the biggest letters on the board that's, yeah, yeah. that's, Ro- that's how I couldn't it works. see I couldn't see what you'd written Roadhouse it's called now Benjamin famously this stars Patrick Swayze yeah yeah as not Dalton this, not this time though not this time though this time somebody has a gambling debt owned by Jake Gyllenhaal and boy oh boy are they putting it to him um, this, <laughs> no, this is bizarre I don't believe that I think that Jake Gyllenhaal Is excited to be in this Look how fucking ripped he got You don't got get that ripped. ripped If you're not excited about something He got very ripped Ladies and gentlemen Jake Gyllenhaal is there um, He's taking over The phenomenal role Of um, <laughs> Patrick Swayze's character In the first He's playing a mild mannered bodyguard Who gets shit done mm, mm. Is he a bodyguard? Uh, well, he's a doorman, essentially. Yeah, he's a doorman in um, the roadhouse, Ben. That's, that's kind of a bodyguard for doors. No, it isn't, Benjamin. Yes, it is. It's the same thing, Michael. It's the it's same the, thing. Anyway, he's, the same thing. he's he's sought out by the owner of this roadhouse, mm. Michael, down in the Florida Keys. Oh, yeah. 
And what's happening is, Michael, this, the tale of our times. Somebody wants to gentrify the Florida Keys. Not going to happen. Um, well, Jake Gyllenhaal's around the roadhouse. Uh, yeah, Jake Gyllenhaal is a former UFC fighter that has fallen on hard times. And uh, basically, he is hired by a, a roadhouse owner and he has a heart of gold, Michael. Of course but, he does. Oh, not if you piss him off. Mm. Um. Because then, oh, then Jake Gyllenhaal is going to take care of business. Yeah, he's going to take care of business with a good deal of assistance from CGI. Yeah, with a with a great deal of assistance <laughs> from CGI. Now, Michael, you might be thinking, what? actually, Jake Gyllenhaal is a fairly grounded performer. Mm. Um, we're really going to have to find someone who's got some acting chops. You right, know, someone who's been tried and tested in the octagon of the silver screen, if oh, you were. Oh, very good. The crucible, of, as, as it were, of public opinion. Yeah, the crucible of... You, you're probably going to have to find someone who is very skilled in stunt work. Go on, yeah, 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 yeah. Knows how to pull a punch. Yeah. And we're probably going to have to find someone who can give a measured menacing performance. No, Ben, you know what you should probably just do? Get one of the most famous fighters in the world and use his hype. Yeah, and that's what they did. They got Conor McGregor. Conor yeah. McGregor's in this film as Knox. Fucking unbelievable scenes. Benjamin, we have to address this, right? We can't go much further than this. We have to address the fact that I know Conor. You do. I do. I know do. him personally. We are not good mates or anything, but I do know him. So yeah, this is a really fucking strange thing for me to see. So for a long time, Ben, I was deeply, deeply concerned that one day Connor was going to show up in a Marvel movie. And I can't imagine anything that would have taken me out of Marvel movies more than going, I actually know him. (laughs) Yes, I actually know that man. so weird. That is very upsetting. Now, also, as you pointed out earlier, Ben, I hate when other people are in films that aren't me. So the bitterness (laughs) that it would have caused in me if... If Conor McGregor got to play an Irish American Marvel superhero, and I'm sitting here going, didn't even ask me. They didn't. Uh, how tall is How tall is Conor McGregor? He's, he's almost exactly the same height as I am. Um, oh, fantastic. Not very tall then. Shut up, you. <laughs> <laughs> see what I did there, ladies and gentlemen. You see what I did. I mean, he. I mean, substantially shorter than Jake Gyllenhaal in this trailer, which is interesting. Yes. To see yes. the intimidating baddie being considerably smaller than the person he's intimidating considerably it's a take it's definitely a take but yeah I, I do believe that Conor McGregor judging from the physiques that are on show the trailer could knock the seven shades of shit out of Jake Gyllenhaal Jake Gyllenhaal Benjamin for, well first of all yes he could <laughs> like there's not a doubt <laughs> in the world that of course he could yeah but um, yeah. Jake Gyllenhaal trained for this that is yes. a man who has dedicated himself to this. He trained with UFC fighters. Those UFC films were filmed at... Th- those UFC scenes were filmed at real UFC events. They had Jake yeah. Gyllenhaal come out to a real UFC crowd. And oh, really? Film those scenes. Yeah, before like the main events and stuff. So, Oh, that's very interesting. He's committed to this. I think that Jake... Yeah. Like you've written here humorously on the notes... Is Jake Gyllenhaal being held hostage? I have a feeling yes. that this is a passion project for Jake Gyllenhaal. I think he's, he's always wanted to remake Patrick Swayze's seminal 1989 hit. Yeah, Roadhouse. exactly. Yeah, and he's always wanted to fright Conor McGregor on screen, and it's gas. I can't believe this is happening. Um, it's bizarre. But Conor McGregor turns up in a completely different film at one point in this trailer, um, and he he makes a smashing time yeah. pun and starts to hit things with a golf club, and I was just like, this is this is fabulous. <laughs> This is, I am I am unapologetically mildly excited for this Benjamin, film. Benjamin, I am just going to have to get all of my friends who do the fighting and we're going to have to sit around and watch this together. There's, there's nothing else that we can do. There's, we just, we it's going to have to be a group yeah, watch. It has to be. It's going to have to be a group watch. You can take out a little space in the back of the, the place where you beat people up oh, and yeah, yeah. you can put you can hang up a screen and you can project it. Well, Benjamin, I have no doubt in the world that that will in fact happen. Yeah, I know, no, I know, I know, I know, I know. Why wouldn't? Why wouldn't? Anyway. Conor McGregor's making it big, and who knows? He might play the Sentry in the Marvel <laughs> adaptation. Well, Stephen Yeun isn't anymore, so, so why not? At this there's a gap. There's, there's a, a gap. gap. He could play the bad version, I suppose. He could play the Void. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He just has the the distinction. Ah, of being you're white. absolutely nothing. I'm the Void. <laughs> the Void. Anyway, what's next? <laughs> 
<laughs> what's next see I've, I've i've hidden the running order from michael here yeah, so it's really gonna it's really gonna upset him um but next is avatar the last airbender speaking yeah. of things that are are being made um <clears throat> good segue there yeah avatar the last airbender gave us our first full trailer here michael and as opposed to the bizarre kind of untread territory of a roadhouse remake this is very familiar yeah they made it 10 years ago remember it was rubbish it was rubbish, um, and this is this is very much the apology trailer for that entire film, mm. where they're like, "This time, we're sticking to the source material religiously, fucking absolutely religiously." There are scenes in this trailer that are directly lifted and modelled from scenes in the Avatar: The Last Airbender cartoon. Mm. They should have called it Avatar: The Last Airbender: The Twenty Twenty Four Apology Tour. And the the purpose of that, I think, Michael, is very much to reassure fans from top to bottom that we're doing it right this time. Mm. We're, 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 we're careful. Yeah. We care. Yeah. Our cast is ethnically diverse, as it should be in this particular case, because the original cartoon was phenomenally ethnically diverse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In so much as cartoons can have ethnicities, yet. Yeah. yeah, in in so much as you can represent ethnicity to the thing. What I will say for this, Michael, is it does look like a fun, good time. It doesn't, it, Ben. Except... It does. It's fucking Fire Nation doesn't be a prick again, aren't they? They just... Uh, fucking, it's just lock it off, Fire it, Nation. If there's one thing you can get the Fire Nation to be, it's at it again, They're Michael. And they are... At it again. <laughs> They are just at it again. The Fire Nation, ladies and gentlemen, is essentially Britain at any point <laughs> in their history that isn't the last 100 years. Yeah, they were all right then, generally. Yeah, they were all right. <laughs> Only because they were told not to be bricks. Yeah. But it, it, look, it, it, essentially, the, the Fire Nation is that. Um, they're a colonizing force and they're causing havoc, um, Michael. And then, of course, we need... Um, the Geneva Convention, sorry, I meant Avatar, Ang, and The Last Airbender, mm. to come along and put an end to that. Uh, so he is their nuclear option, Michael, their mutually assured destruction ben. in the form of the Avatar. Yeah. Ben, I suppose the only real question about this is, is it going to be One Piece or is it going to be Cowboy Bebop? But that's 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 the dichotomy of Netflix uh, live action adaptations, Michael. You've hit the nail on the head there. I recently tried to watch Cowboy Bebop, and I have to say, it's so it it is religiously faithful to the concept material or to the to the source material. But the issue is, anime doesn't play well to live action because it's a very stylized format. People loved One Piece, though. Not as stylized in the format. The characters were given a little bit of breathing room, I thought. I see. Uh, but also, kind of fun and not very serious uh, mm. in One Piece. Very serious in Cowboy Bebop. Mm, Cowboy Bebop was kind of all over the place. Look, yeah. Ben, I have no great attachment to... I just kicked something under my desk and broke it. I don't now, know what it was. Mix Mammy, he's actually moved away from the microphone. Was... Ma'am. Ma'am, I moved away from the mic that wasn't Ben this time, but any other times that it happens were definitely Ben. Actually, actually. what is your mother's name Pamela? It's Pamela for the purpose of this show. Um, <laughs> Pamela, if you're listening, he's been moving away from the mic all the time. Now, I know you didn't raise him that way, Pamela. I know you raised him as a consistent mic distance man. Yeah. Mick the mic distance man is what they used to call him, but he's gotten very lax. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mike distance man is actually my Dutch name. <laughs> ben! Yeah. Look, we don't have time for any more jokes about Avatar The Last Ember, Airbender because I've got a great joke about Tom Holland. Okay, go on, tell me a joke about Tom Holland. Well, tell us the news about Tom Holland. <laughs> this isn't news, Michael. Why have you brought this up, you fuck? It's on the notion. It's next on the notion. Michael, we don't follow the notion. We follow the Google Slides. Oh. Anyway, Ben, Tom Holland's uh, <laughs> bonus from Marvel was accidentally sent to uh, the British actor Tom Hollander. Yeah. And yeah. revealed to the world. I wish he so kept I spent, it. That would have been funnier. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Benjamin, I've spent the entire week deriving a new comedy character based on that incident called Tom Hollandist. Oh, very good. Because, you see, we've got Tom Holland, yes. Tom Hollander, and Tom Hollandist. That's that's one for all the uh, English language teachers in the room. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. You'll enjoy that. Yeah. There's a little comparative superlative joke for you. 
so now I'll do a little skit based on the character Tom Holland. Oh, very Hollandist. good. Okay, okay. Um, hello, my name's Tom Hollandist. I'm a British actor, and um, I'm considerably more Holland than the other two. That's anyway, it from us man. this week. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> we're going to wrap it up there um, in sheer shame. But come here to me. Speaking of the perils of colonial meddling, Michael. I've been thinking about that joke all week. It's very good. It's very good. Yeah. It's very, very yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Um, mm. uh, yeah, but speaking of the perils of colonial meddling, Michael, I've got a trailer for Monkey Man this week. There's only one thing I can say about this trailer, Ben. Yeah. The fucking Fire Nation are at it again. The fucking Fire Nation are at it again. There, there is a, a very big Fire Nation vibe to the the enemies in Monkey Man. We got a trailer for Monkey Man this week, Michael, and I have to say it's risen very quickly to the top of my Jesus Christ. I want to watch this list. Yeah. So it's basically here's here's what it is, Ben. It's Dev Patel, your mate and mine, Dev Patel. Yeah. But he's John Wick. Now, I, I, blah, this is going to irritate me right down to the ground, Michael. There's been a ton of comparisons to John Wick on this trailer, and with good reason, I suppose. Go on. I'd uh, like to hear more about this. Essentially, what Monkey Man is, Michael, is a revenge fueled fight choreography showcase, but this time in India. Sounds like John Wick. In India. And that's oh. a fair comparison, Michael. Sounds like, like extraction. It, d- yeah, actually, a, an even better comparison. But this time we're not white savoring an entire country. Good good stuff from Dev Patel. So this is Dev Patel's directorial debut, Michael. Ben, Dev Patel, yes? Wasn't Dev Patel, wasn't he the Fire Nation in the, the other avatar? He was, yeah, he was Prince Zuko. Yeah, yeah, stop fucking with the Fire Nation, Dev Patel. Stop fucking with the Fire Nation, Dev Patel. But this is Dev Patel's directorial debut, uh, Michael. Um, He's been an actor for many, many years. He's been in quite a few things, going all the way back to Skins back in the day, Michael. Do you remember Skins? Was he in Skins? He was in Skins. Um, Yeah, and then he was in Slumdog Millionaire, Michael. Famously. The film that no one can decide is, is is it actually racist? Is it a racist film? I can't remember. I can't remember. Um, it hasn't aged well, Michael. Um, hasn't it? We'll put it that way. But uh, he was also in, more recently than that, Michael, The Green Knight from A24. We both enjoyed that. that was a, but even though it was a little bit oh, boring. It was a very strange, mad quest, Michael. Very good, though. Very good film. Um, and he's gained himself something of a stellar reputation as a young, competent actor, Michael. Um, and here he is in his directorial debut. Now, originally this was given to Netflix, um, and it was going to be a straight-to-Netflix gig. And then Jordan Peele, your friend and mine, Michael. Yeah. The fellow who does all the spooky old horror JP, films. We call him. Yeah. yeah, old JP. He stepped in, Michael, and he went, no, 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 this is great. We're putting this in cinemas. Um, and he put the budget forward to put it out into cinemas. So that's that's pretty good. Um, but what it is, Michael, is a, a revenge fueled, as I said, cor- fight choreography showcase. Um, but it's, you cannot search this up, Michael, without every single pop culture news site being like, Dev Patel does John Wick. Dev Patel does John Wick. Dev Patel oh, does no. John Wick. That's all it is. We just did we just, it. Well, we just you did just did it. Um, but come here to me. That's right. What? That's right. You sit there. Get yourself away from that mic. Sit back. Speak into it from back there. I'm going to do the rest of the podcast like this. <laughs> Very unhelpful. But Michael, this is far more Bollywood than it is John Wick. No one's doing any dances there. We didn't see anybody getting married. Well, first of all, we haven't seen the full film. <laughs> but second of all, Bollywood action films are their own genre unto themselves, Michael. There was a great one, Ben, where it was in Dublin and they had a fight in the Lewis. Yeah, they had a fight in the Lewis. Do you remember that? Yeah, mm. yeah. That's what stopped my Lewis today. That's what made me nearly late. Two, two lads filming a Bollywood film on top of your tram. Um, one of my favourite things about that scene, Michael, is that they completely misunderstood how fast the Lewis goes, number one. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Controversially, ladies and gentlemen, Lewis means speed in Irish, and the public transport that bears his name really doesn't live up to that. Um, yeah, yeah. It's aspirational rather than inspirational. <laughs> yes. Um, and like many great Irish aspirations, falls a little bit short. Um, Ooh. But come here. Ooh. That's going to get us in Ooh. trouble. That's gonna get I, think, the- I think Killian Murphy's going to win the Oscar. I certainly fucking hope so um, but come here, then I'm inviting him on the podcast Michael I'm doing it I'm just oh, yeah, yeah. I'm going to go to every pub in Cork until I meet him and I'll be like hey, come no. here to me Killian 
Come here to me. Um, but number two, they also greatly underestimated where the Lewis runs in Dublin City. <laughs> completely wrong Ben yeah. the two lines don't I think they had to link up the two Lewis lines in Dublin because that movie showed it happening yeah I'm convinced Michael that public pressure after seeing how good it would be if the Lewis lines mm. actually overlapped uh, yeah. is what drove that uh, the Irish government actually taking that action great stuff Benjamin yeah talk about monkey man yeah so it is far more like a Bollywood action film uh, primarily in one key area Dev Patel's character in this is is a young man from the slums of India. He is an absolute underdog. In John Wick, we meet John Wick at the end of his career, or what he thought mm. would be the end of his career as an assassin. He is the boogeyman of his world. In a world where everyone's an assassin, assassins are afraid of John Wick. Mm. Okay? This is very, very different because, number one, so far, everyone is not assassins. Yeah, although we don't know that yet. We don't know that yet because it's only a trailer. But number two, Michael, it's very clearly uh, drawn out in the in the thing that there's a lot of social commentary on this. Um, the, the caste system in, in India is ridiculed. And we have uh, one of the phrases that we see is the rich don't see us as people. Mm. Um, Bollywood action films have a huge focus on social themes and social commentary running throughout them, which is not something we see in all action films, Michael. Mm. Uh, but very very important the other very important thing that we're seeing here Michael is family bloodline drama is a huge part of Bollywood in general but Bollywood action films very much so and it's heavily hinted at I don't I don't think we can say that it is definitely the case it's heavily hinted at that Dev Patel is a bastard child of a crime lord oh yeah and he's taking it on we get one scene where he interacts with the big bad villain of this the demon king um, mm. as he as he frames him uh, and he says son and Dev Patel just says don't call me son and then he goes oh. to try and kick his butt yeah there's a whole oh, thing going on there Michael oh I didn't realise that was son as in not just a derogatory term for a young man no I, I think in this case it might be very much uh, you're my pop and oh. yeah, yeah. Oh, I hope he kicks the shit out of him I'd say, I'd say he probably does. The last thing that we see, uh, Michael, that we kind of miss in John Wick and got a little bit in the later films is yep. there are comedic elements throughout. Uh, one of the things that sets Bollywood action films apart is very often the the main character is a very competent fighter, very mm. capable, but is not infallible in terms of sometimes they can trip, sometimes they can mm. fall, sometimes there's a comedic gaff. Uh, that has to take place and we see one very funny scene in this trailer Michael where he goes to do the classic badass action guy jump through the window and then realises that skyscrapers have very very strict safety regulations yeah yeah I'm not jumping through a, a pane of glass in a skyscraper not a fucking chance that's thicker than me yeah, yeah. and I'm thick <laughs> he's thick as a plank lady <laughs> thick Ben Colopy, ladies and gentlemen thick as skyscraper glass <laughs> But come here to me. Um, what this was a masterclass in editing a trailer. I thought it was a little um, bit too long. It it's a little bit too long, but I'm fairly certain it sets itself apart in several different ways. We get a we get a host of scenes in this. Michael uh, he fights in an underground fighting ring at one point. Charlito Copley is there for some reason great stuff he's the announcer in the ring he wears a mask sometimes as the monkey man to take on the the great white monkey from mm. indian mythology mm. we'll probably do an episode on that when it comes out michael well, that'll be fun not? uh why not and then and then everything is on beat michael it's great there's there's cut scenes time to the beat of of him being prime minister anyway doesn't matter michael Fabulous. you're telling me to wrap it up i'm not so telling it's time you to wrap, wrap it up. i'm not telling you to wrap, it's time it, up. To wrap it up i'm michael. telling you to move it's time it to on, wrap it up ben. we're going to end the podcast the whole point of me doing that silently is that you don't fucking announce it to the listeners you finish I your just, thought and you move along I want to make it very clear to Pamela that you are included and valued on this podcast. That your contributions are not as some invisible co-host for me to bounce off. Benjamin, have you skipped over the review of the show you were talking about? I have, yeah. All right, yeah, all right. Have, yeah. Okay. Speaking of excellently choreographed fights, Michael. Yes, go on. I watched four episodes of The Brother's Son this week. Never flipping heard of it even for half a second. What's that? Really? Never heard of the it. The Brother's Son is Netflix's new limited series, Michael. Go on. And I think it's aimed probably to capitalise a little bit on the Asian American surge of content that we're seeing as a result of everything everywhere all at once. Mm. The beef. Um, 
and beef. Exactly. Um, and this is another in a long line of those. Um, Michelle Yeoh is in it because, as you know, the only rule in uh, Asian American sitcoms, mm-hmm. action films, yep. anything like that is Michelle Yeoh has to be in Benjamin, it. Benjamin, does yes. it pass our famous baseline Asian American show test, litmus test? Is it, Which a, is, is it a waste of Michelle Yeoh? It is not a waste of Michelle Yeoh. Michelle Yeoh is phenomenal Fabulous. in this series. Um, and it's based on a very simple premise and, and probably an experience that many people have lived through if they are Asian American in the United States. Um, and that is the, the separation of a family uh, with one part of the family going to America to seek a better life and another part of the family remaining in China or Taiwan or wherever uh, that may be in that <laughs> Asiatic experience. <laughs> wherever, wherever. You can't see how dismissively Ben is waving his hands. Like that was know. a round hand gesture. Over there, whatever. You've just gotten your mic privileges back if you don't want them taken away again. If you don't want to be you muted you out of existence. You can't, you can't take my mic privileges away. I do the edit. And you know that, Ben. <laughs> That's true. So I know you're putting on a front here. You're putting on a brave, brave front. But I'll just delete your whole track again. Like that one time I did it and you had to re-record your whole episode reacting ah. to me and pretending it was a live conversation. That's very kind of you saying that that was your fault and not mine. <laughs> um, but a very kind of you, Michael. But I will I will hoist my own petard as often as I can. But very interestingly here, Michael, one of the things I found uh, very interesting about this is they are from Taiwan. They are not from China. Because, you know... International opinion on China, not great. <laughs> International opinion on Taiwan, a little bit more favourable, I would argue. So that's quite interesting. Uh-oh. It's quite interesting to see that. But this is based on the two sons of the Sun family, so S O N S of the S U N family, oh, or Soon as it's pronounced in the in the thing. But it's the brother's son. Is the way that it's played with. Um, and Bruce Sun is the son that goes to America and lives a very sheltered life as a medical student. And oh, yeah. Charles Sun is the man who remains in Taiwan and becomes his father's right hand man in a criminal empire. And oh. he is he is essentially the John Wick of this universe. He is the the boogeyman. Ben. Yeah. Isn't that the plot of Shang Chi? I think it's a little bit the plot of Shang Chi. It's entirely <laughs> the plot of Shang Chi. But this is better because there's no white saviour. There's no white saver in Shang-Chi. Shang-Chi was played by Simu Liu. Oh, it's Simu Liu. I mixed him up with uh, Iron Fist. Never mind. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Never mind. But yeah, but possibly one of the best parts about this, Michael, is that Simu Liu is not in it. (laughs) (laughs) Um, (laughs) You took him down a peg then. Well, now, ladies and gentlemen, if Simu Liu's online presence is anything to go by, he will hear this and we will be shouted out in a very angry series of tweets or threads. Fucking get in, Ben. Everything is content. Everything is content, and that's how we're making it big this year, ladies and gentlemen, controversy. (laughs) Um, I've said it before, I'll say it again. This is going to really bite me in the ass when there is a court case of libel or slander, and I'm going to have to be like, I was a joke. Um, But anyway, it is said around that uh, somebody is targeting the Soon family, and the sheltered life that Michelle Yeoh was living in the United States with her son Bruce comes tumbling down when the father figure of the Soon family is caught up in an attempted assassination and Charles is sent to look after his mother and uh, son. In a lot of the Asian American stuff that we're seeing, Michael, the core of it is the dysfunctional family experience that comes from being second generation immigrants. Mm. And we see the tension between mother and son. There is a favorite son in this. He is Bruce. And Charles' son is trying to do his duty to the family but at the same time, Michelle Yeoh is not checking her own preference for children. It's it's very interesting. The choreography is wonderful, Michael. Um, there's a little bit of Mary suing from certain characters. Oh. Um, there's there's a kooky, infallible detective character um, play, played by Heidi Kwan. Uh, it's Alexis, and she knew Charles back in Taiwan. And she's come to America, and she's a bit of a Sherlock, and she has no time for anybody else. She's just looking for her big case to make her career. Mm. Benjamin, you know I don't like to be reminded of Sherlock. You I know, know I'm sorry. Me. But it is the closest to one we can come up with. Um, it's very very good Michael it's a fun enjoyable watch there are some fabulous character actors in it um, there's one character called Blood Boots and he's played by uh, John Zhu Shang and he's absolutely brilliant he is essentially a hard 
cr- criminal from the triads who comes to America and realizes that he could have a much better life in America, and he's having a great time. He's he's having Just a great bloody time. Um, it's a very enjoyable series. It's probably not going to win any awards. It doesn't have the deep roots of something like Everything Everywhere All at Once. It's far more comedic in its tone, uh, but it is fabulous it's it's a fun watch it's well choreographed you want to see the brothers succeed i thought it was great well isn't that great hey ladies yeah. and gentlemen well, it's editor mick here filming this a little bit later i'm just popping in to say that i've been speaking to the lawyer and the lawyer wants me to point out that the opinions of benjamin colopy are not necessarily the opinions of sherlock sherlock productions limited now back to the show Anyway, hopefully nobody edits that in with some kind of, I don't know, denial of culpability for a legal case later on. Hopefully not, anyway. Benjamin, speaking Um, of legal cases, though. Yes. We don't have a leg to stand on if Earth comes after us. Oh, Michael, Earth one day is going to crumble, and when it does, we're all screwed. Oh, no. We're all screwed, Michael. It's no good. Michael... I've been sitting to myself awake at night saying, do you know what's awful? Climate change. Climate change. change. Now, Benjamin, you were denying it five years ago, but you're on board now, are you? Michael, you know for a fact that I have never denied climate change. I've denied the existence of God. I've denied my ever liking yourself. I've denied... (laughs) um, That's the worst thing you could think of, was it? Yeah, it was pretty bad. Um, I've denied... Yeah. I can't think of anything that won't actually paint me in a horrible light, so I'm just going to leave this bit. I'm just going to put it Women's down. Women's rights. But no, I've never done that either. Well, no, I have, actually. <laughs> yeah, no, I am a big old misogynist, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. So that's Famously. Yeah. yeah, famously. See, I don't know if we can make these jokes anymore, because two weeks ago, Michael, we realised that the, the nation of America doesn't have a sense of humour. Famously, Benjamin, the nation of America doesn't have a sense of humour. So I don't know if everyone's taking me very literally, which is very well, upsetting. Well, there's no reason to wor- there's no need to worry, Benjamin, because we've got the Earth to worry about. Yeah, and the Earth is going to end one day, possibly in a trope known as Gaia's Revenge. Oh, who's Gaia? Yeah. Yes. Gaia is uh, famously, Michael, one of the titans from Greek myth. Uh, mm. It is the Earth, essentially. She's the god of the Earth, or the titan of the Earth. Um, and she represents all things earthly. Uh, but Gaia is a name that you'll hear thrown around as kind of a sential, celestial manifestation of earth or terror literally in some cases literally in some cases michael uh gaia's revenge is a very famous trope and it is as you may have guessed michael when nature's wrath takes a form um, and pretty much tries to wipe out humanity oh go on give me some examples yeah so i mean the most famous example that we could possibly think of here michael is poison ivy the one that most of our listeners will be familiar with is poison ivy ivy poison ivy in her modern iteration is very much an eco warrior yeah was she always or was she just a girl who was doing crime with plants so one of the most interesting things about that michael is way back in the day the first appearance of poison ivy was in 1966 oh wow yeah 1966 and it was in batman 181 Mm. um and she was created by the the duo of robert uh kaniger and Carmen Infantino. Carmen Infantino, you probably would have seen art from once or twice. But um, Robert Kinniger has come out, he's been asked many, many times, you know, did you want to create a strong female character? Did you want to create a man-hating kind of man-eater? Did you want... And he was like, no, um, we got a mandate because of the popularity of Catwoman on the 1960s Batman Mm -hmm. show with Adam West. Mm -hmm. Um, And basically, she was such a popular character that they wanted more female villains. Yeah. Um, and so the creators of the Batman comic were given a mandate and they had to create several female villains uh, to add to the rogues gallery and it just so happened that of the many that were created Poison Ivy rose to the top um, originally not an eco-warrior in any sense a man-eater in quite a literal sense she would feed them to plants Benjamin where did they go on their mandate? Um, they probably went bowling maybe axe throwing yeah yeah, um, yeah. great stuff yeah VR rock climbing sort of VR yeah oh yeah yeah, probably a few, Vior. A few beers. Maybe they sparred a few rounds a few in an rounds octagon. Of spa. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. A craft beer then in a in a in a local distillery. <laughs> in a local distillery that's really popping off these days. Fuck man, great you know, mandate. You know? That's a yeah, great really, mandate. really putting Dublin on the map. Anyway, mm. go on. Sorry, poison ivy. <laughs> but just a girl who's doing crime be... with plants. 
that would be a, a famous example of that. And we've seen her in everything. She has every kind of representation. She's one of the most popular characters on the animated Harley Quinn show that's coming out from DC with Kaylee Cuoco at the minute. She's voiced by Lake Bell on that. But her eco-terrorist slant mm. um, really began to develop within the DC universe. The DC universe is a great place to start when you're looking at the Gaia's Revenge trope because the Gaia's Revenge trope can be split into three distinct categories, Michael. Go on. Um, you have the sentient Gaia Revenge trope, mm. which is where Mother Nature or nature in general has a mind of its own. All right, go on. Um, and is actively trying to wipe out humanity. Oh, uh, so it's a sentient being, essentially. The you have happening. the metaphor. Do you mean the happening? Uh, yeah, a bit like the happening, Michael. Or uh, what would probably be a little bit better than that um, might be Ensign Isengard. I don't know what that is. Uh, so in Lord of the Rings, Michael, famously, oh, uh, uh, no, I do, of Isengard. I know what that is. Of course you know what that is. Just, uh, yeah. that famously. A, that felt a bit out of context, Ben. I don't know why I didn't understand what you just said. That's there. okay. Um, that's absolutely fine, Michael. I don't mind that at all. But famously, uh, in Lord of the Rings mythology, you could look at Isengard and Saruman's kind of push for industrial revolution as a metaphor yeah, yeah, for the yeah, industrial yeah, revolution yeah, yeah. in general and the death of romantic nature, yeah. etc. Yeah. Um, he is pushing for genetic experimentation. Mm. He's pushing for the destruction of nature for resources. And... Nature responds in the form of the Ents. Now, the Ents are a slow-acting response, mm. but they are a sentient manifestation of nature itself mm. uh, that comes to wipe out this attempt at industrialization. Don't forget uh, and that's that's pretty swamp thing. Yeah, so that brings us on oh, to our sorry. next one, um, which is pretty good. Um, swamp Thing would fall under the Avenger Okay. Uh, of Gaia's Revenge. Uh, very, very often in these narratives, especially in comic books, Michael, when we want to give somebody nature powers, what we'll do is we will choose an avatar of nature's revenge and they will be imbued with the power of nature in order to avenge it, will they, essentially. Will they be imbued with the power of wind, earth, fire, water, and heart? Yeah, you might get someone like, oh, I don't know, Michael, Captain Planet. Oh, very good. <laughs> So he, yes, a designated Avenger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's not really nature's Avenger, though, is he? Because that's not Earth coming to get us. That's Earth. No. That's for kids in the 90s. So It is, yeah. Captain Planet's job isn't really fixing things. It's restoring the status quo. Like, let's not make it any worse. <laughs> Captain Planet... Let's not rock the boat. Yeah, yeah. Captain Planet isn't here to, like, wipe out humanity. Captain mm. Planet is here to make sure that Earth is all nice and lovely and welcoming for humanity. Yeah. Ben. Yeah. Have you ever watched Captain Planet? Yeah. I, the, my only recollection of Captain Planet, Michael, is the bizarre college humour Don Cheadle sketch. Very good. Have you ever yes, seen it? Where he puts his fist up people's mm. ass. Ben. <laughs> yeah. You know who played Gaia in Captain Planet? Go on. Whoopi Goldberg. Get out of Whoopi town. Whoopi Goldberg. Ben, the cast of Captain Planet. Sorry to derail your talk about Gaia's Revenge. The cast no, of ahead. Captain Planet is fucking spectacular. You wouldn't believe the cast of Captain Planet. Do you know, Ben, who plays the villainess who accidentally burns off half her face and then hides it under a fringe? Oh, Do you remember that villain, I'd... Ben? I have a vague recollection, Michael, but I'll be honest, you'll have to tell me well, who played it. Well, you'd never fucking guess in a month of Sundays, Benjamin. It was Meg Ryan. What? It was Meg fucking Ryan, Ben. What do you mean it was Meg it was Ryan? It was Meg Ryan. What was she, she doing? Was playing a villain in a 1990s animated series about an Avenger coming forth from the planet and saving the world. LeVar Burton is one of the five kids. Ah, no. Ah, no, no. Would ah, you believe no, no. that? LeVar Burton is in this, Ben. Oh, and, no. I mean, the list goes on. Jeff Goldblum's in it. That's insane. Tim Curry's in it. It's, it's one of the most impressive voice casts doing nothing you've ever heard. That's insane. It's incredible. Did, are there any particularly poignant episodes for today's landscape? <laughs> I think you're referring to... Uh, Season 3, episode 12, Benjamin, if it's Doomsday, Doomsday it must be Belfast, in which <laughs> the villains, a little rat man played by Jeff Goldblum, although not in that episode, I will point out, um, 
give nuclear bomb triggers to a Catholic and a Protestant in Belfast. <sighs> and now this is their words, not mine. A Jew and an Arab in the West Bank. Oh, for fuck's sake. And a black and a white, again, their words, not mine, in South Africa. And But you know what's oh good about God. that episode, then? You know what's good about that episode? Um, Gaia is the one who's, like, guiding them to try and solve this, played right. by Whoopi Goldberg, as a very kind of sexy, statuesque, black Wonder Woman-esque representation of the Earth. Okay. Um, and she's like, you have to stop. Imagine that's Whoopi Goldberg's voice. I'm, I can't do it. You have to stop everyone from blowing each other up. It would be very bad for the planet. But <laughs> here's the incredible thing. They don't actually solve Belfast, the West Bank and South Africa. <laughs> I, I mean. They help six people, six individuals come to terms with each other and fix those six people. They don't fix I, the problem. I see. Which is a surprisingly in fight. Like, there's a better take on, on Gaza and Israel and Palestine in this than I have heard some modern American commentators make. Like myself. <laughs> For example. Anyway, it's great. Captain Plant. That sounds fabulous. Yeah, yeah, no, shit, it's rubbish. It was made by your mate, Ben. Capitalism himself, Ted Turner. Jeff Bezos. Oh, Ted Turner. Ted Sorry, Turner, yes. My, Jeff- other, my other capitalist mate. The Jeff Bezos of the 90s. It, it strikes me, Michael, as a very early example of greenwashing. Go on. Yes, it was. That's well, what it exists uh, for. Yeah, yeah. That's the point. Yeah, Ted Turner. Greenwashing. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, greenwashing, which has just been made illegal in Europe, Michael. And this is apropos of nothing to do with our topic today. But uh, greenwashing has just been made illegal in the European Union. You're not allowed to uh, falsely kind of create narratives that would make it seem like you're doing a bit more for the planet than you actually are mm. um, in advertising, which is, of course, an appeasement of all those pesky, pesky climate fucking advocates and activists who keep coming out there and giving us a hard time making money Mm. in capitalism but come here to me Michael yes We've gone through two of them there. We've gone through sentient nature, yep. um, which again, DC Comics is a great parallel for. You've got the green in in um, DC Comics. That's the collective hive mind. And then you've got avatars like Captain Planet or the Swamp Thing, who's appointed by the green, and they would be the Avenger trope. But then, Michael, we have a third form of Gaia's Revenge, which is metaphor. Oh, go on. This is the one I'm yeah. most intrigued by. And you spoke a little bit, Michael, about a great example of that. Um, that's generally, generally speaking, how that manifests itself in narratives, Michael, is it's our own hubris as humans having pushed the environment to a breaking point whereupon an unintended consequence comes back to haunt us. Oh. For example, yes, Godzilla. Oh, Godzilla, Ben, you shouldn't have blown up that atoll with nuclear bombs. Why would you do that, guys? Now we're going to have to deal with a genetically modified lizard. Yeah, yeah, especially Godzilla Minus One. Yeah, especially Godzilla Minus One. Which, Terrifying yeah, film. Yeah, exactly. Have you seen it now? Do you feel bad? I've seen bits of it. Do you feel bad, Benjamin, that I was shouted down for nominating it for my film of the year because it came out right at the end? Did I shout you no, down? No, not you, the listeners. Ah, screw the listeners. Who needs it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's going to hurt us. <laughs> yeah, okay. that's going to be an empty Discord. Uh, speaking of, ladies and gentlemen, there's a Discord link down below. You can join oh, us and t- shout us down uh, personally. Rock- no, no, we're not oh, finished. Not we're not finished. Get out of here. Just give it a little Discord shout out because I mentioned the Discord. Oh, yeah. That's my new rule, Michael. If I mention it, I'm going to give it a shout out. Pop up onto it down there in the Discord. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the metaphor one is probably the one we see most often in literary fiction or in sci-fi or something like that it's where humanity's kind of shot itself in the foot as it were oh. um, by being polluty bastards oh and then we have to deal with a consequence of that one of the best examples of that that I have read recently Michael is none other than a manga you are just you're just going for this aren't you I'm becoming the podcast weeaboo Michael <laughs> it's 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 happening it's happening I don't want to I don't want Weeaboo to. is one of my favourite words, Ben. It's such a funny word. It's just <laughs> it's a gas. fucking fabulous word. You absolute fucking weeaboo. Yeah. Go on. Yeah. So this started years ago, ladies and gentlemen. We'll be occasionally watching anime on Netflix. And now I'm probably going to move to Japan because yeah. I just think Japan has a better, more honourable culture. Yeah, you know? Yeah. It just doesn't doesn't compare with No, I take that back. I will never do that. Ugh. Um anyway. There's a fantastic manga, Michael, yeah. called Fool Knight. Never heard of it. 
uh, yes, not many people have. It's a bit of a bit of a bit of a cult classic in Japan, Michael. Now it only came out in the twenty in twenty twenty, so I don't know if it can be called <laughs> okay. a cult classic. So um, it's new, but it's by it's it's new, but it's become very popular underground. If okay. that makes sense, Michael. Um, it's by a gentleman called Kazumi Yazuda. Go on. Um, and he basically created a world. It's been a hundred years, Michael, since the world was covered in thick, heavy clouds caused by pollution. Oh. Which have blocked out the majority of sunlight. No. Oh. And caused something of an ecological cascade or collapse. Oh. And what's happened is, naturally, Michael, without a direct source of sunlight, plant life has pretty much collapsed on the planet. Well, that would, Ben. Now, speaking as a recovered scientist, we'd be yes. fucked. We'd be so fucked, Michael. And that's where the the fun kind of interpretation of manga is, we wouldn't be fucked, even though we absolutely would, Michael. If plant life on this planet collapsed... We're mm. fucked. There's no fun dystopia that we get to live out. There's no humanity clings on. Humanity's <laughs> fucked. I'd love to live in a fun dystopia. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what that'd look like. Sounds but anyway, fun. Humanity's, uh, humanity's fucked if plant life collapses. We're done. It's game over. But in this, Michael, it hasn't quite happened yet. And that's because of a radical new... Um, a radical new procedure, Michael, called uh, oh, transfloration. Oh, becoming plants. Becoming plants, Michael. So this is where it gets really, really interesting. It depends on which um it depends on which version of the comic you read translated into English. You can find it online where it's translated by fans uh, ahead of the official translations by its publisher here in English speaking countries. Yeah. Um the official uh, adaptation puts it as fluoromorphosis yep but the fan ones call it transfloration but it is essentially Michael a very grim process that involves an awful lot of body horror and disgusting artwork um, what happens is let's say Michael you get cancer oh okay now I hope you don't well right? look Benjamin whether you saying it will have no effect on whether it happens or not so rest assured all right. Well, let's say you get a terminal illness of any kind, Michael. Okay, thanks. Okay. What will happen is you will be in this hundred year in the future society where things aren't great and it's hard to move upwards uh, and be socially mobile. Money is tight. Okay. In this dystopia. But you can, if you're very, very ill, opt to go for transfloration. Become a plant. Become a plant. So what will happen is you will undergo an operation where a seed will be placed in your body. Okay. And over the next two years, you will become a living host for a plant. Ugh. So that the plant can grow. Oh, that sounds terrible. at the end of the two years, you will become a strange human plant that can exist in this brand new sun-depleted universe. Ugh. But you die, essentially, right? Now, it's kind of a classic social lottery, Michael, in that the only people who will undergo this are the desperate and the dying. Mm. Um, Because the price tag attached to it is 10 million yen. You get paid 10 million yen? You get paid 10 million yen to do this, and you basically live out your best life for the last two years of your life. What's 10 million yen in real money? 100,000 euro? I don't know. I don't know. Not a huge But it's a lot in that society at that point. All right. Okay, um, so it's centered around. Then we're, we're introduced to that concept immediately. It's kind of the framing device of the whole. Oh, it's comic. a million euro, I reckon. All right. Okay. Well, that's pretty good, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm yeah, gonna have to have a good time. I'm gonna that. have to look that up, Ben. You spin your wheels. I'm gonna look that up. So it it centers around. Then we focus on our protagonist, not naturally, to give us kind of a, a human emotional connection to the story, and that's t- uh, Toshiro. Kamiya and anyone who actually speaks Japanese can correct me because my pronunciation is definitely off and I apologise um, and he has a bit of a moral dilemma to contend with um, his mother is terminally ill um, and she struggles to afford her medication he is the working son he's trying to earn money to pay for her medication and basic necessities to live but he hasn't got enough of an income um, and because of those limited options he is considering undergoing the uh, fluoromorphosis or transfloration mm process uh, he will sacrifice his body for financial gain because he doesn't see much of a future and his mother will be set up for life she can afford her medication um 
the true line of the comic explores his journey navigating the social dilemma that brings and it emerges as the story goes forward there is a supernatural element to this michael Mm. because the what what the plant what the seed feeds on in flora morphosis is the human soul right oh so there's a there's a little bit of magical thinking there and basically can't get sunlight can live off your soul and then naturally as the story progresses michael and slight spoilers here we come to realize that the converted humans are not dead as we originally thought they were they're plants they're becoming a brand new kind of hive mind thing oh like the green um, like the green exactly from dc comics it's a fascinating uh, comic that brings up a lot of really really big moral questions and quandaries and i would strongly recommend it michael it's a great representation of guy's revenge as metaphor benjamin it sounds a little bit like some of the scenery in annihilation so another great example of metaphor michael or theoretically sentient nature but we'll get into that in a second um Gaia's Revenge in Annihilation is a great example, except it comes from space. Yeah, it's not Gaia at all. It's Space's Revenge. It's Space's Revenge. But it does have a lot of the tropes of Gaia's Revenge in that nature is actively trying to destroy what it finds. Mm. Or is it? I thought it... Is it? We or don't is know. it? We never find out. Or, we, is, or is it just like a weird oily alien man? That's the great mystery of Annihilation, because I've never read the books. I probably should. Um, They'd probably be quite, quite good. But Guy's Revenge is a fascinating trope that we're probably going to see more and more of, Michael. The most recent example being The Last of Us. Oh, yeah, the mushrooms are inside of everyone. They're all up in everyone's business. They're all up in everyone's business, Michael. It's nature's revenge. Not necessarily as metaphor, but that's the closest one we can find, because there's no designated avatar of retribution. Mm. Um, Exactly, like The Happening. Like the happening. It just happened because we dug too deep. We've seen it a few times, Michael. We saw it in that really creepy Australian zombie flick starring uh, What's-His-Face from Sherlock. Uh, He plays none other than Watson. I can't remember who plays him. Martin... Martin Freeman. Martin Freeman, yeah. Martin Freeman zombie movie. What was that called? Martin Great Freeman podcast. Wasn't a zombie Australian zombie movie, was he? He was. Why did you remind me of Sherlock again, Ben? I hate um, Sherlock. It's called Cargo, Michael. And oh. in Cargo, uh, what's happened is it, it's believed to be a consequence of fracking, but fracking has uh, split open the earth, Michael. Mm. And it's released a gas that turns people into zombos. I had seen that, Benjamin. Benjamin, was, um, was Mother Earth or was our neglect of Mother Earth? the cause of Cthulhu escaping in Kristen Stewart is stuck under that water under that water base yeah so again this is a fun one this is a this is a nice exploration of Gaia's revenge as metaphor because what happens is human meddling unleashes something it shouldn't have done now I don't Mm. know if it's exactly Gaia's revenge because if we're dealing with something like Cthulhu we have to decide if Cthulhu is an other dimensional being hell bent on madness hmm or if it's simply a huge biological structure that emerges from the earth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and that's a bit of a quandary. I think in that, it's heavily hinted that the Cthulhu is a huge parasitic organism or a huge host for parasitic organisms and therefore follows some of the rules of nature. Seems to be, maybe. But it's just a big giant creature that yeah, would yeah. naturally cause some kind of eco-revolution by it re-emerging. Like mm. if you found, I don't know, the Meg, the Meg. Um, from the Mariana Trench with Jason mm. Statham. There's another great example. Or the Meg 2. Stop meddling in the trench. And the Chinese are a grand bunch, grand of, bunch lads. of lads. Grand bunch of lads. Grand bunch of lads. But, ladies and gentlemen, what, what? are your favourite examples of Gaia's revenge in storytelling? Do you prefer the sentient, the metaphor, or the Avenger? Let us know in a few different places. You can find us on the interwebs at www.shomrabeug.com, S-E-O-M-R-A-B-E-A-G.com. It means tiny room in Irish. Don't talk during my bit, Michael. Uh, you can find us on our ACAST <laughs> website, www.shirlookshirlistenpodcast at acast.com. You can't. Great, fabulous stuff I've gone on yeah. up there. It's great stuff. You can hear all the episodes. Good, old-fashioned time uh, ladies and gentlemen you can find us on instagram at your luxury podcast we can it's, it's buzzing it's 
it's buzzing, hopping off over there. You can get reels and short content. If you can't stand us in long form, you might be able to take a minute of us a day. Yeah. Um, and that's fine by us because yeah, it yeah. all counts. That'll do. Uh, It'll you can <laughs> esteemed company of my mother. You can find us on TikTok at Sherlock Sure Listen Podcast, and you can find us on re- uh, you can find us on Threads and X at Sherlock sure Sure Listen. Ben, I forgot when I was giving out about Sentry that one of the characters is a click clock content creator. Oh, fuck off. <laughs> it's awful. That's awful. That's terrible. Yeah. Boo, Marvel. Boo. That's annoyed week? me more than anything else you're doing. Next week, Michael, we're going to be taking a look at a classic Victorian horror genre. We're going to be taking a look at who's afraid of the king in yellow. Oh, the king in yellow's back, is he? The King in Yellow's back. We're going to take a look at him and how he's pretty much shaped cosmic horror for the last 40 years. Oh, okay. This sounds exciting. Including very grounded examples like True Detective. So we're back. Into that next week. Baby, it's back. It's back, baby. Tune in next week. Bye-bye. See you next week. Bye, everybody.